Hello, hello, everybody. I'm so sorry I'm late getting on here. Uh, this is it's Jennifer Brennan, the Garden Coach, and um, and um, I, I I saw that there were seven people signed up. I'm hoping I didn't scare. Oh, there's there's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm late getting signed up. Uh, my Zoom skills just completely slipped through my total head today. <laughs> well, what they did was they changed the password. Uh, you know what? That's going to be the bane of our existence, isn't it? So, so welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, okay, oh, we've got 18. Very good. I'm going to uh, click open the Q&A panel, and I'm going to move it aside and over here. And then we also have, I also have the, um, uh, the chat. We're going to, I'm going to open up the chat. Okay. And I'll be, I'll be ready to get started pretty soon here. I'm going to, I'm going to try to scope this one down. So welcome, welcome everybody. So you all know that, um, that, and we sent the, um, the outline of the notes. There are a lot. There are a lot for today because a lot's been happening. So what I'm going to do is go over all the notes and talk about what we've been seeing in the Chalet um, Information Center. And oh, good, we've got 18 people. Welcome, welcome to Chalet Garden Coach. And um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to show you all the things we've been seeing, and then talk about what you should be focusing on and then I'll take all the questions and answers uh, at you know at, at the end if it's a if it's a question that goes with what we're talking about what I'm talking about right away I, I'll kind of keep my eyes open and 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 fit that in as we're going along so welcome welcome everybody um, at least at least we got some rain uh, I only got a half inch at my house I'm hoping you all got at least a half inch and maybe more I know I talked to a couple of people that in that whole storm event had an inch and a half I'm hoping that none of you that are that are viewing and attending this webinar were involved in any of those tornadoes uh, that was pretty scary wasn't it um, we had that about 15 years ago, and and it's it's pretty frightening to live you know live through that. I actually grew up in Tornado Alley in Kansas, in Kansas City, and also in Western Kansas. So I grew up every spring, you know, running to the basement every time there was a tornado a, a tornado warning. So 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 I'm 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 not proud you know to say that. Okay, so now let's get going. And um, what's been the challenge? The biggest challenge. Um, this season and this whole growing season, this whole summer, have been um, the, the fluctuating weather patterns. And the nice thing that I like saying right now is the fact that the weather is and has been fluctuating. So we've got some cooler temperatures, we've got some rain, the, the humidity has been fluctuating up and down. And one of the biggest, most wonderful differences is that we're getting, we're getting lower night temperatures than from the high day temperatures. And our plants are really benefiting from that. And as the days get shorter and shorter and shorter, all the plants are, are starting to recover from the gruesome, you know, hot, dry summer that we, we have been dealing with. Okay, so now um, the, the number one thing is keep planting. Go ahead and keep planting, you know, as long as you're committed to being you know, to watering, you know, if you don't want to water things, then hold off until September to do any major planting. But you're still going to get some really good values in going into this next, you know, this next um, two months. So keep your eyes open, and and this is a wonderful time to plant. I have good friends that have a nursery out on um, the East Coast, and um, their newsletter just had, oh, and this was actually from a company out of Connecticut and talking about why fall is one of the best times to plant. And fall here in the Midwest and you know on the East Coast is they consider all of August and all of September to be fall planting time. And one of the nicest benefits is the soil is is nice and warm. So the roots get in the soil and they're ready to grow and all they need is the water. And then the nice thing is, as the days are getting shorter, what that does is that makes the plant focus on, on its roots. As the days get shorter and shorter and shorter, 
the plants are geared to that and they know it's time to stop putting active growth in the top and really focusing on getting those roots developed. Now, this is, this is just the, the 13th of, uh, of August. It is still really good to get in one more fertilization of all of your landscape plants, your, and you know, and, you know, all, you know, the roses, most, and most, most importantly, are any of the plants that are gonna have spring flowers, you know, for next year. Because now is the time from July 15th, all the way until you know October, the end of October, this is when those plants are forming the flower buds for next year. So if you can give them the fertilizer now, that's the building blocks that they use to put all those parts together. So um, you know any any blooming trees, crab apples, service berries, um, um, any of the viburnums. Um, and you know, lilacs, lilacs, those wonderful spring blooming things. Give them a good dose. I like the bud in bloom. Um, I like any of the Dr. Earth brands because they last for 60 days. And you can just sprinkle that over the top of the cell. You don't have to dig them in, just sprinkle over the top, even over mulch and water them in. And the plants are really gonna use all of those nutrients to, you know, as the building blocks to get things together. Um, I had a customer come in today. She didn't understand what the uh, the, the round little balls were on the, the the flowering tree that she had, and she just didn't understand why those flowers didn't open. And those they were it was the fruit from a crab apple. So 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 you know you you want to make sure you give that fertilizer to those types of plants as they're going to continue forming the fruit that's there, and then also use that excess um, phosphorus to make the flower buds for next year. So help your plants out, water and fertilize. All right, um, okay, let me stay with my notes here. Um, okay, um, keep monitoring your rainfall. Really watch it. We're still not getting what we should be getting at 80 degrees. We should be getting an inch and a half of, of, of rain a week. And you know, ideally, we get a half inch on Monday, a half inch on Wednesday and a half inch on Friday night. And, um, but it's not happening that way. So monitor with your rain gauges. If you have a sprinkler system, monitor how much water is actually being delivered to um, the root zones of the plants. Um, here's a really sad sample that came in. This is a service berry. I mean, isn't this just terribly sad? And you can see, um, the customer didn't think it was worth watering because uh, we'd had so much rain in May. And so this poor plant is really suffering. And you know, I, I'm hoping that, that we caught it in time. So by watering consistently going forward, it, will, it would save this plant. But that's one of those, this is one of those sad, sad stories. So make sure, you know, make sure you're, you know, you're really watching, watching the rainfall. Also, like I said, with sprinkler systems, put a, a rain gauge or just even like empty tunic fish cans next to um, in, in the root zone of your, of your landscape plants, just to make sure that enough water from the sprinkler system is getting to that root zone and it's not just hitting the leaves of the plant. So water after the sprinkler runs, check to see how much is accumulated in those empty cans. And then if you need to extend the length of time or, you know, or water more frequently, you really need to do that, really need to do that. Okay, so now, okay, the things to look out for in your garden. Um, the turf, the grasses have really, really have, have taken a hit. Uh, I've, I've been bringing in really icky samples, <clears throat> but they actually, <coughs> excuse me, they're actually so messy that I just decided to bring one of my reference books. <coughs> Pardon me. We're seeing a lot of summer patch and a lot of brown patch. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Those are two fungal diseases. One is Magnaporta and the other is Rhizoctonia. They inoculate the grass plants in May and then we get these hot dry spells. This is when the disease shows up. Now, the time to protect and prevent it is in May, 
and the fungus is actively inoculating the grass plants, either the roots or the blades or the, or the crowns. Now, it's a little late to use a fungicide. The best thing now is to water those plants and make sure that you get them, if, if they didn't have enough rain and didn't have enough water, they went dormant. The cool news is when uh, the plants get a half inch of rain a month, it keeps them from, um, from um, dying, but they go dormant. So it all turns brown, but the crowns are still alive. So when you water on, on, you know, regularly towards the end of this season, then it will wake them up. Then give them that fertilizer. Now, traditionally, um, the, 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 the Labor Day fertilization is from the 15th of August in between the 15th and the, and the 15th of September. That's when you wanna get that fertilizer down to really help the grass plants. Because they've been suffering so much, I've been encouraging people to get it down as quickly as possible. Like even last week, I was talking about it at the Garden Coach, but now is the weekend to do it. Get your fertilizer down. And you wanna use, um, a, if, you, if you've had all these diseases, you wanna, you wanna focus on using an organically based uh, fertilizer because it will help promote the beneficial fung fungi and the beneficial bacteria that will outcompete all of the pathogens. And so uh, my favorite is, is the Espoma brand. And you can, when you go to, you got a, a link to show the products and it will link right to our webpage so you can see what the Espoma lawn fertilizer and it has a red bag. So we, we nicely call it the red bag, the Espoma red bag formula. And it's, it's got a 15% nitrogen, which is a little extra nitrogen. So you get a quicker green up and we call it juiced because it has that extra nitrogen in it. It has zero phosphorus, which is the, the law these days, and, um, and, 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 uh, and, and I think an 8% of um, potassium, which is good for the health of, the, of the, the cells of the plant. So get that down as soon as you can and water it in. I like to recommend people to water the lawn one day, put the fertilizer down the next day, and then water it in, and then be amazed at how, you know, how, how it greens up. Now, oh, I was gonna show you. Um, if you have weeds, then now is a good time. If you have more than 25% weeds, now is a good time to use a weed and feed. And Bonide brand is, a, is, is the brand that we sell here, and it's a weed and feed. So it has a very good fertilizer, and it has an herbicide that will kill 200 of the most common weeds that are in the lawn. And that includes Creeping Charlie and, 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 and all those things. Now. Another really good one, and if you've had the creeping bent grass in your lawn, is the Scott Step 1 for seeding. Now, I used it on my lawn on Sunday, and then we, I had that half inch of rain on Monday as the tornado storm went through. And I'm going to show you a photo of what it has done to the crabgrass. And it's not labeled to kill the crabgrass, it's labeled to prevent crabgrass from germinating. But the active ingredient in it is called mesotrione. And mesotrione is this neat, neat chemical that doesn't damage bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and or um, fescues, but it will cause the, the, the chlorophyll to burn out on creeping bent grass and nut sedge. Look what it did to the nut sedge in my lawn. Okay, can you see this? I think it's gonna show, yeah, look at that. Look how it turned it white from Sunday to Wednesday or to this morning. Is that incredible? Now hold on, I have another picture. Uh, oh, this is, this is my patch of bent, creeping bent grass. Okay, see it's starting, to, it's starting to show the color of the white. And then look what it did to crabgrass. Oh my gosh, look what it did to the crabgrass. Oh, this, this, this big photo isn't really good. Hold on, let me see if I can make this better. Okay. Look, that's going to be better. Look what it did to the crabgrass. It turned it completely white. Isn't that phenomenal? So if you've got those things in your lawn, I would encourage you to use the Scott Step 1 for seeding. It has a phenomenal fertilizer. And then you can also, you'll be ready to um, actually use, you know, a grass seed on the lawn if you need to fill in any bare spots. Now, after you fertilize, you know, water it in well, you know, you really water it. And then I like to tell people to wait two weeks because if you have brown patches, 
and they're not larger than six inches in diameter. From the thumb, my thumb here to there is six inches. If they're not larger than six inches, then the healthy grass plants around the brown spots will go three inches in each direction. And after two weeks, you'll see how it's really filled in. And then you'll have a better idea of whether you need to reseed and how much you need to reseed. So wait those two weeks and you'll be amazed at how, how the lawn improves. And it will really improve. People don't believe it because the lawns have just looked so terrible. I mean, so terrible. All right, so now let's keep, okay, so all the other diseases that are in the notes, we're seeing brown patch, we're seeing summer patch, we're still seeing pythium, and we're still seeing a lot of dollar spot. Okay, now um, I want you to be aware of your lawns because the Japanese beetles were out attacking all of our landscape plants, making holes and everything. And they usually last about six weeks. They're just finishing up, but that means that the eggs that they've been laying the last six weeks are going to be hatching in our lawns and this is when the grubs are going to start showing up. So if you didn't get a grub, you know, grub X down on your lawn earlier in the year, it's a you could still get an application and it would probably still be effective. And if you wait till you see the grubs and the grub damage, then it's too late to use grub X. And then, then you have to use, um, it's the ingredient in it is called Dilox and, and it, it's, 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 it's called, it's from, um, it's, it's from, um, the uh, Bayer. So, you know, so, so kind of keep your eyes open, you know, for grub damage, because that will be the next thing that will start showing up. And I'll be talking about that, I'm sure, in the next two weeks when we start seeing samples coming in. Okay, now, um, all right, lots and lots of slugs, lots and lots of slugs on the hostas, any of the ground hugging plants, we're seeing lots of holes on those. So make sure to keep using the sluggo because you know that will that that's an earth friendly natural. Those little pellets are embedded with iron phosphate. Slugs can't resist, they eat it and it, the, the iron phosphate kills their appetite and then they go, crawl off someplace and die. But it will really reduce the numbers. If you don't kill them now in the next, in the next six weeks, then they will overwinter and come back larger next year. So if you've had slug damage, be sure and treat for those slugs. Okay, now um, uh, the animals, the animals are eating all the tomatoes. And usually the animals we're dealing with are the you know, squirrels and chipmunks and some possums, some raccoons. So, you know, to protect, the best thing is a barrier. If you can fence the garden, put netting over it that, that they won't, it won't keep them from getting to that, but it, it delays them a bit. And then I like the product from Bonnet called Rat Magic. I've talked about it before. It has a horrible name, but it's labeled to prevent rats, chipmunks, and squirrels. And use it as a barrier around your gardens. And you sprinkle it two feet wide around all of the edges of your gardens. And as they're walking in, it, 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 it really disturbs their nasal passages. And a lot of times they're, de they're, 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 they're deterred from coming in and eating your favorite big tomatoes. So, you know, protect your, protect your plants from that. Okay, now um, the other thing is um, the rabbits that are eating the plants. And they've gone from adolescent stage, babies to adolescents to adults. And any of them that have started bad habits eating your, your hostas and all your other, you know, all your other plants, roses, they'll eat the roses to death. Um, if they have developed bad habits, you know, keep using that liquid fence dual action uh, rabbit repellent. That is the most effective because it really irritates their nasal passages and their, um, their, um, their mouths and they, they go someplace else. Okay, let's keep moving on here. All right, um, okay. So many fungal leaf spots on everything out there. And this is not just on the leaf, this is a tree peony. And this is, and look, look at all of the, this is the fungus that got into the petiole of the leaf. And when you put it under the mi microscope, you can see how this is the pycnidia. This is the fruiting structure of the fungus that will inoculate the plants for next year. So it's worth treating this with one of the wonderful fungicides and you can see it was on the leaves as well. It's worth treating this one more time and that can be the immunox and it can also be the all-in-one 
rose and flower care. And that's the wonderful fertilizer, insecticide and fungicide all in one mix. And I would use the recommendation for a rose for a tree peony like this. And it's two ounces in a quart of water and you pour that right where the, the trunk or the stem is going to the ground. And it's taken up and it stays in the plant for eight, uh, for six weeks. And it will stop the sporulation and produce, you know, and prevent, you know, prevent a lot of the spore load for next spring. Be prepared to use it again next spring, starting April 15th. And then six weeks after that is June 1st. Six weeks after that is July 15th. That's a wonderful, wonderful tool for roses, things like um, you know, the, um, the, the tree peonies, regular peonies, and there's a shrub recommendation on it. So for shrubs, um, you use one ounce per foot of plant height in a quart of water, and then you pour that. So usually whenever it's over four quarts, it's just a gallon, and then, but you can really help the plants. And then that fits fertilizing before August the 15th, then you have your fun, the fungicide treatment and then also an insecticide treatment. So excellent, excellent. One of my favorite products to really help take care of your plants and make it easier for you and better for the plants. Okay, now, um, okay, and then apple scab. Um, okay, oh, this, since we're talking about it on, on shrubs, these are red twig dogwood. And it's a variegated red twig dogwood, and this is this is uh, this is another this is a circospora leaf spot, and boy, with the the high humidity and the high temperatures we had, these plants are just loaded with this. And here's a here's a better a better one, two different plants loaded with it. So this one would you know benefit from treatment with um, Immunox and or that rose and flower care. So so. And these are, this is like the Rocky Horror Picture Show again, isn't it? Now, um, I want to show you this. I'm, I'll take it out of the bag because, yeah, I'm not in the greenhouse. All right. This, this, these were beans. These were bush beans. And this poor gentleman had no idea what was, what was going on with his plants. And I kind of knew when I saw it at the information desk. And so I said, let me take it to the microscope and see, see how these are all, you know, discolored and we call it, um, it it's called, it, 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 you can see all the yellowing. And then that was a big one. And then look at this one. I don't think you're going to be able to see this, but when you look at the underneath side, see there's texture on that. And if I get it really close, no, nah, it's not, it's not magnified. These are loaded with spider mites and they crawl all of the two spotted spider mite. And because these were bush beans, you know, the harvest was almost finished. So he still had some beans to harvest. And then the best thing to do was to just get all those beans harvested and then rip all these plants out and then plant a new, a new row, a new batch, you know, for, 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 for a fall, uh, you know, fall harvest. Um, that's how bush beans go. When you plant them, you harvest them all at once. They're great for canning. Great if you have a big Sunday dinner and you have, everyone wants to have beans. Different than pole beans where you're harvesting throughout the whole season. But this one, this one, look, I mean, this is just, this was, this one was almost disgusting. Okay, so, so spider mites in my hands. Ugh. When you talk about having to use um, hand sanitizer because of COVID, <laughs> how about spider mites? Okay, now, um, Oh, now I'm starting to itch everywhere. Oh, that's terrible. All right, um, I, I, I'm gonna kind of backtrack. I was talking about fertilizing. Um, this was a sample of a rhododendron that came in and a customer just wanted it identified. And this is one of the small leaf rhododendrons that has beautiful flowers. But you can see, you can see it's just starting. It's just starting to make its flower buds. Look right there. So, so, and so this means you really want to give it that fertilizer. Holly tone is great. Bud in bloom is wonderful. And so give it those, give it those tools. So, and you know, the building blocks so they can go ahead and make those flower buds. I'm sorry, I backtracked on that. I forgot about that sample. All right, now um, um, you're going to see a lot of this in the lawns. This is crabgrass, okay? Now this has got more of an upright format because this was growing right next to a driveway. And it was in between a driveway and a sidewalk. So it tends to be more upright whether normal crabgrass lays flat and spreads out, you know, on, you know, over the surface of the lawn. But, um, 
we had what we call breakthrough. And um, because it was so warm, and um, we, we, anyone that did a pre-emergent, you know, it lasted and lasted and lasted because it was so warm and so hot, um, the seed didn't germinate till we got a little bit of rain. And so it all just, it, it's, it's everywhere all over the lawns right now. And that's what the turf guys call breakthrough. You know, they put it, if you put a pre-emergent down and you still got crabgrass, it's because it wore off. Pre-emergent usually lasts eight weeks to 10 weeks. It wore off with the heat being so high and the cell tension being so high, it breaks down faster. And then all of a sudden, the seeds, they are still there and they can germinate. So, so we're seeing lots and lots and lots of that. Now, the thing about crabgrass is it's an annual weed. So the first time we have a hard freeze, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die but it makes lots and lots of seeds. So be prepared to use a pre-emergent like crabgrass preventer in the spring in April, April 15th, or use the Scott Step 1 for seeding again next spring. And that mesotrione is a wonderful pre-emergent. It keeps any weed seeds from germinating, any, any crabgrass and any, any nimble will from germinating, but it will still allow you to, to use grass seed. So one of my favorite, one of my favorite products. Okay, now uh, let's keep going right here. Okay, now's the time um, for the Volutella stem blight on boxwood to be spreading. So when it's hot and humid like this, and we do get a little bit of rain, that's when it will sporulate, and then it goes from one plant to another plant. It can go from boxwood back to pachysandra, or from pachysandra into boxwood. So be on the lookout for that. If you've had any sections in your boxwood that turned tan colored or dead, and you just thought it was winter damage, there is a good chance it was the Volutella stem blight, or it's also called Volutella stem canker. And so kind of be on the lookout for that. Bring samples in so we can see them. I can put it on the microscope and reassure you. And then, and then one of the best products to use on that is that rose and flower all in one care because of the fungicide, the fertilizer, and the insecticide. So, you know, so you can really, you can really protect them, you know, right now. There's also a hose in sprayer where you can spray and it lasts every 30 days. And you know, that's another great thing to protect the box with. Okay, I'm looking at the time, it's 35. And um, okay, we still got 20 people. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, so now I'm gonna go into the what to do in the garden, what you should be looking at. So one of the main things is you wanna really focus on deadheading. Get out there and prune off any of the spent flowers that are on the perennials and the annuals, and that will help continue the bloom period um, for our plants. And so deadheading is a must. Do it on the roses, um, things like um, any of the monarda, the bee balm, and um, on the, the phlox. If you deadhead the flocks, it will continue the bloom all the way through the end of September. So, you know, so, so do, do that deadheading. Okay, this is also the best time to evaluate your perennials in your garden. If you see anything that needs to be divided, and when you look at a perennial to decide whether it needs to be divided, if it has a hole in the center of the plant because the new growth has grown out to the edges, that's the indicator that it's time to divide. And so anything that blooms early in the spring is, this is a perfect candidate to, to, to be di divided right now. So irises are wonderful to divide right now. Daisies, um, I'm gonna be doing a lecture. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I don't have the, the, the date in front of me. Oh, I can look at the date. I'm doing a lecture on dividing and transplanting. Um, that's gonna be, here I'm looking at my calendar. And um, yeah, dividing and transplanting is um, the 21st, 21st. So that's a week from tomorrow. So, you know, put that on your calendar and, and I'll talk about all the details on, you know, how to do the division and, and the best way to transplant and which are the best ones to do now in the fall and which are the ones to hold off or not, not touch. There's some that say, don't you dare touch me. So we'll go over that, you know, next week. Okay. Now, um, all right, so um, yeah, you wanna do that, you wanna target that in between the 15th of August and the 15th of September. You can sort of push the envelope till the very end of September. You wanna get the plants divided and, and 
and transplanted in the ground so the, the roots can form. And you want those roots to form eight weeks, six to eight weeks before the ground freezes solidly. So if you look at those dates, if, you know, get them in by September 15th, you know, eight weeks after September 8th, 8, 8, 8, 8, 15th is, is November, is November 15th. So, so, so you want to have, and the ground freezes solidly, usually the first or second week of December here. So, so that, that's your timeline on, you know, on getting those things done. All right. Uh, oh, I was talking about my friends having a newsletter that went out talking about why fall is the best time to transplant and or plant perennials and um and there's pros and cons the um the, the pros are that regular rainfall is returning you know instead of the hot dry summer soil temperatures are still extremely warm so it it, it really encourages active root growth um you know it's it, there's you know you have a good amount of time you know for the roots to get established before the ground freezes solidly and then the other thing is the cooler ambient temperatures the cooler air temperatures don't leave the plants in stress as much as the hot summer does so as the days get shorter and the nights get cooler it's so much better for you know for our you know for our plants now the cons cons are some plants go into total senescence and one of those is brunera don't even think about transplanting brunera they hate it. They absolutely hate it. I'll give you more of those details next week. Okay. All right. So, um, so, so now I just wanted to give you some positive about after having such a tough, tough summer, we still have a lot to look forward to with our, you know, our fall. And also it's so much easier on us humans to be out in that cool, crisp air, you know, lack of humidity, cooler temperatures. We can get so much more done. So, okay. So now let's, let's keep moving ahead. Here we go. All right. Now, the other thing, um, is this is the best time to get rid of as many weeds as possible. So, so weeds in the perennial beds, hand pull those, um, and then you know, and then you know, then crab, you know, the, you know, crabgrass. You can. These are really easy to to hand pull, and you know, pull those out. Um, and you know, I like I just leave mine to die. You know, and you know, with the with the, the hard freeze. As long as you as you fertilize the lawn, the lawn is ready to fill in as soon as as soon as those get as as soon as the crabgrass gets killed. Um, um, okay, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Uh, creeping Charlie, violets. This is the time to really go after those. And the the best the best weed killer to use is the um, the chickweed clover on oxalis um, because it's labeled for all of the tough weeds. You spray it and it will it will kill them in actually ten you know ten to fifteen days. Um, sometimes you know, the tough ones like creeping charlie and violets you can just spray two weeks in a row and that you know that will really get rid of them. If you're going to use a weed and feed, use that. Wait two weeks and then come back with the, the chickweed clover and oxalis spray and spray any of the weeds that are kind of hanging on and that'll really get them. It's like a two, a two, a two punch attack, you know, you know, on those plants. Okay, so now, um, here we go. Uh, fertilize one more time. All right, in this, okay, here we go. Um, okay, you, you can, um, you know, one more time, if you didn't get one application of the fungicide, insecticide, and fertilizer down, do one more time now on things like roses and grapes and you know the ornamental grapes, things like that, um, really help it. Continue to spray your vegetable garden with um, the Bonade, um, either orchard spray or the Bonade tomato and veg spray. It's sulfur and, um, and um, organically derived pyrethrin. So continue spraying that to prevent the, the, the powdery mildews and all of the insects that are still attacking all of, all, of our, all of our vegetables and fruit before we can get to them. Okay, um, animal repellents, keep doing the animal repellents. You wanna do that you know, at least once a week or, you know, or, or once every two weeks. Right now, the pressure is so high, do it, do it once a week. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, we put, I, I put the garden coach, um, um, link on here so if you to, to, to keep registering for the garden coach and let me make sure I'm, I haven't missed any of my fun samples here I think I've gotten them all I think I've gotten them all yeah I, I brought some really cool ones um, here's some okay here's some 
questions. I'm going to go ahead and look at the questions. Um, I didn't see any chats, but I've got some good you know, Q&A. Okay, here we go. My mock orange shrubs didn't bloom this year. What should I do so that I have blooms for next year? Your question is just perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, now is the time to check to see how much sun they're getting. Oftentimes those mock orange are planted on the, the backs of our properties. Those are classic grandma plants. And um, as our landscape trees got larger and larger and larger, they ended up being in more sun. So they might not have enough sunlight. So that's a problem. The other thing is they, you know, they, um, they need the, um, to form their buds now. So give them the fertilizer. And we had a hot, dry summer last summer. And so the poor plants didn't have the building blocks to make their, they didn't have the water and they didn't have the nutrients to make flower buds, for, you know, for the bloom for this season. So, so really help the plants out. Water diligently, really water, you know, at least two times a week, hopefully three times a week if we're not getting our rain. And that will really help them and give them some good fertilizer, some high phosphorus fertilizer. And that should really help. Okay, what is the best way to get rid of poison ivy? Really, the, the best way to get rid of poison ivy is to use one of the, um, um, the Roundup products or any of the products that have glyphosate. Now, there is one that's labeled for poison ivy, but be careful because that has a triclopyr in it. And usually what happens with poison ivy, it's growing around other desirable plants. You know, up, uh, you know, up, you know, up one of our favorite trees in the backyard, and and so if you use the poison ivy killer, that the, the triclopyr stays in the soil around the root zone of our desirable plants, and it can impact those too. So I like to just encourage people to just use this, you know, a, you know, a, a straight, you know, glyphosate product like plain Roundup, the blue bottle Roundup, or um, you know, or um, or any of the other products that have glyphosate in them. And, uh, and you just spray the leaves, leave it for 10 to 14 days, and the plant does the work for you. It pulls the active ingredient down and kills it at the root level. And once it's browned out, then you can go in and cut all those woody branches off. But be forewarned, because the oils are still in the dried leaves and in the, and the, and the, and the wood. So wear gloves, wear long sleeves, don't burn it because that smoke can, you can breathe that, you know, that irritant into your lungs. So just, you know, put it in yard waste bags and get rid of it, you know, that way. But um, that, that is really the best way to do it. So, so I know we don't sell Roundup here at Chalet anymore, um, uh, but you can still get it. And it is really the best product because it has zero soil persistence. When it, 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 it gets on the soil, it breaks apart into eight different amino acids and it's never absorbed in through the roots of desirable plants. So the only way it's taken into the plant is from leaves that are sprayed and it's absorbed in, and then it's a meristem inhibitor. It stops the growth point at the top and then it gets translocated down and, jumps and stops the growth point down at the roots as well. I need to check the time. Okay, it's 1.45. Um, I'm looking to see, um, um, oh yeah. I had some other some other um, great ideas. I, I want to I want to encourage you to look forward. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move um, this uh, this screen over a little bit. Um, I want to encourage you to you know look forward. We're doing um, we're doing um, a, a farm truck Friday again tomorrow, but all the plants are going to be available in the nursery. So there's going to be values of all the, you know, all the, the perennials and some woody plants. We don't give you the, we don't, we don't tell you early. So we make you wait just like it was the farm truck. Uh, we have to, you have to come to the parking lot. You used to have to come to the parking lot to see what came off the truck. Now we just bring it in and it's in the nursery so you can, you can shop it. I think, I think that people are going to be sent an, an, e, an email, an e-blast that will tell you what's being, what's being, you know, um, also available as well. So kind of stay tuned for that. If you ever have any, if you have questions for our staff, and, and our, you know, our customer call center. Um, the best way is to email <clears throat> using um, help at shallynursery.com. 
and then they they filter them and they get us to get it to the right people you can also call and it'll go to the call center we actually have a direct extension in the plant information center and it's 634 so call the number 847-256-0561 and you can go straight to the call center now not call center the, the plant information center so that's 634 um my phone got hooked back up and i may regret telling you all this but um it was turned off for the whole the whole summer until just last week and so my card is valuable again so my extension is 225 so that's my extension at my desk and i rarely sit there but you can leave a voice message but then my desk down in the in the in the um the plan information center is 255 all these numbers isn't this terrible uh, you know, and everyone's going to go, what, what? So, okay. Oh, here's another question. Here, let me, let me, you know, on my question and answer column here. Here we go. Uh, if you pull weeds and put down preen, I love that. Will the soil be safe to put plants into the soil that has had preen put in it? Absolutely. Preen, preen only stops seeds and it doesn't bother plants. So if you only plant plants in, the, in, a, in a, a vegetable or garden area, like your vegetable garden, you can use preen. Now, if you're gonna do seeds, don't, because it'll keep the seeds from starting. But um, the, or, there, there's an organic version of preen, which is made from corn gluten meal, and it only lasts eight weeks. You have to use that every two months. Um, the, uh, the, the, the pendomethalin or the trifurolin, which is in um, the regular preen, uh, that lasts for um, uh, three months, you know, so, so you just treat every three months. And once, once ever, if I ever pull weeds out of a bed in my house, like a garden bed at my house, and it looks neat and tidy, the very next thing I do is sprinkle preen. So no more new seeds germinate. And uh, it's one of the best things. It can reduce your weed pulling by half if you you know if you get in that good habit of just putting the preen down every three months it is such a cool tool wonderful wonderful tool that you know we should all take advantage of because we're all busy busy people okay now let me see oh 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 i didn't show you this this is really fun okay if you are going to do uh, grass seed on your lawns okay we used to always have this chart on the back of our grass seed here at Chalet. And Chalet has really wonderful grass seed mixes. And the mixes are prepared by a company that does grass seed for golf courses. And those are golf courses in Southeast Wisconsin and Northeast, Northeast Illinois. And the, 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 the varieties of bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and fescue that are put into them are based on testing of disease resistance and the two or the, the, the previous two years of diseases that they see. So you, ours are the most disease resistant varieties that you can put in. And with all the disease we saw in our lawns this year, it is really smart to, to overseed. And overseed is when you put grass seed over an existing lawn. Now, if, you're, if you have a lot of bare spaces, then, then this is something that's really, really important to know the difference on. Okay, so now see, see that chart right there? And you can see that this is just the right amount. This is too much, and this is not enough. And so if you do too much, then all these, all these, we, all these uh, grass seeds outcompete each other. When this is just right, I noticed over the years that it is exactly the same exactly the same as the poppy seeds on the rows and buns over at Irving's at the hot dog place. This is, this is Andy Greenspan, who is the owner of, 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 of Irving's. And that was my hot dog that day. And he let me go behind the counter to show because I'd always tell people, go get a hot dog if you want to know how thick to spread your grass seed. Okay, so go do that. Ooh, I haven't had lunch. I think that's what I'm gonna do as soon as I get off of this webinar. I'm gonna go get a hot dog at Irving's. Ooh, that sounds delicious. Okay, um, so, so, so when you do your grass seed now, and I'm gonna give you another little uh, help on this. When you're, uh, when you're calculating how much seed to get, when, um, you, 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 when you're overseeding an existing lawn, 
that means you know you're, you're spreading seed over a lawn that's there that maybe just has some patches then you use one pound for every 500 square feet all right most average lawns are 5,000 square feet okay so but if you're patching bare spaces to do that pattern that I showed you you need um, a one pound for 300 square feet so that's how you can calculate. Who says you'll never use math, huh? Okay, so now, okay, no more, no more. Um, oh, here's a, here's a chat. Okay, should I cut out the dead part of the boxwood plant and cut out where uh, there are brown leaves? How should I, how deep should I plant the iris tuber? Ooh, you have lots of good ones. Okay, so yes, if there are brown sections in the boxwood and they're brown right now, yes, and you wanna, you wanna reach in as deep as you can it, where the brown section is and cut it off down almost at the base where that branch is attached to another main stem. And it probably has the volutella stem blight. So you're gonna cut that out and then get rid of it. Now, the nice thing, you're not gonna get a lot of active growth for the rest of this season, but the new growth that comes in next year, all of those other leaves that are around the hole that you'll make, they're very opportunistic. They're gonna grow into the bare space. So it will fill in by the end of next April, early May. So it's a, it's a good thing to do. Um, and this is, and cut out where there are brown leaves. Now get rid of those brown leaves because they're not gonna come back, okay? Now, when, you, when you're planting an iris tuber okay, to do the divisions, um, you wanna, you, iris tubers like to be on the top of the surface of the soil. They like to bake in the sun. And so you're gonna angle the tuber so that a bottom third of the tuber, and tubers are usually anywhere from four to six inches long. So you're gonna angle it. So if you're gonna do two thirds, let's say it's a six inch long tuber, um, then two thirds is gonna be four inches. That's gonna angle down into the soil and the other is gonna be up at the top. And so you just, you know, you're, gonna, you're just gonna put that right in there, keep it well watered, and then again, you want it as much on the surface as you can, and then those roots will grow in. Because you're training it, that tuber is going to grow across the top of the soil and root in as it's going. Really good, good question, an excellent question. As you're dividing iris, now is, the, now is the time to make sure you don't have any iris borer. You'll see any tubers that might be mushy. If you're digging in and you smell an odor, that's a bacterial um, um, rot. And that's because of the holes that the, the iris borer have made in those tubers. So this is a good time to check to make sure you don't have that and you don't have iris borers. It's, it's also a good time to spray the foliage if you haven't you know, cut the fans, that's cutting the, that's cutting the foliage off of the iris tubers. If you haven't cut that, give it a good spray with the systemic insecticide, and then that's gonna kill any of the, um, the borers that are, the, the eggs got laid at the end of July, early August, and then the borers hatch, and they're crawling down as I speak to get into the tubers. So if you didn't get a chance to cut that foliage off, spray with a systemic insecticide, like one of the bio-advanced rose and flower sprays, and then that will stay in the plant, and as the, as the, as the larva is chewing it way, its way down, it will get the insecticide and it will kill it. It's a great, great, great tool, great, great tool to keep things, keep things going. Okay, it's, it's 155. Um, since I got started late, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep these things going. I'm going to keep this going until until um, 205. Okay, because I feel oh it may shut me off at two though, but because it was a scheduled thing. But anyway, anyway, I apologize that I just goofed. I didn't have the password. Um, you can tell that um, um, my 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 lovely helper that guides me through these. Uh, actually is is away on a, a vacation. So I thought I knew what I was doing. Oh my, you know, don't don't assume, don't assume. So so um, it's I'm so happy that you all are joining me on on the on the garden coach. I'm getting so many wonderful uh, compliments about the garden coach service from people that come to the um, the plant information center. So I'm so happy that this is filling a great demand and a, a wonderful need and that I can kind of keep you kind of appraised of what you should be watching out for and what you should be doing in your garden. And I'm, I'm predicting that going forward in the next three to, to, to six weeks, it's gonna be a beautiful time in our gardens and we'll be able to catch up from this horrendous summer that we've had. And we might even be able to enjoy time not in our gardens. Oh, here's another, I think I have another, 
No, I thought I had another another question. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's so much fun um, being here at Chalet and being able to um, help you with your gardening. I, I, I'm really appreciative of it. Thank you so much. All right, see you in the in the Plant Formation Center. All right. Bye now. <laughs>